Hey, welcome back guys. It's nice outside. Um, we are doing a little bit of pruning and cleanup. It's that time of year. Get out there pruning your trees. Um, and I, we'll just do a little walk around, just something low key today. Um, out there with my wood chip hill manager and branch collector. So stick around. So I did want to uh, do a pruning video this year, but to be honest, I've been so super busy with work. Um, and then during off hours doing consultation follow-ups uh, that I just kind of had to get out and do it. So, you know, you can kind of take these as the after of some pruning. You can see some large cuts were made where there is really bad uh, gamosis and canker rot. Um, so we pretty much just kind of open up the inside, any kind of inward growing branches, crossers, vertical brancher, branches. We take those out as a priority. For peaches, they only fruit on second year wood. So you want to be careful how much you know new growth you take out. If you take out too much, then you won't get any harvest. This year, I kind of let them, uh, I'm gonna let this one kind of go. So I'm not gonna worry too much about up top. I'm not gonna get a ladder out and prune it because I don't know how long this fruit tree has left. And I'm just gonna kind of try to minimize pruning, very just moderate pruning in order to maximize harvest. And uh, we went and pruned pretty much all these trees. Um, apples and pears, you wanna kinda try to promote little nubs and um, uh, spurs that will fruit. And same kind of idea, remove straight up verticals, remove inward growing branches, branches that are crossing and directly competing. We've got some ties there to kind of pull open some branches um, that are newer and still flexible and they'll harden up. Um, over the year over the season and kind of open up instead of going straight over top of each other I can swing them out a bit and get more 3d space and sunlight Just making some little adjustments like that um, This one here I pruned up the side a bit because I wanted to be able to walk you know under the tree a bit so I offset its uh, you know um, shape a little bit hopefully it's not too um, You know uh, uh, aesthetically unappealing also cleaning up this wild apple here um, it was getting really vertical um, you do want to have a couple branches that do reach the vertical or else it's going to keep sending water shoots out if it's not at its height that it wants to be at um, so you can see I've kind of cleaned up most of the lower stuff up in the top here we've left a couple verticals to kind of get up a little bit high sorry about that Sun I was considering taking this off, but same idea. If I take too much off the tree, it's just going to sucker, or not sucker, but send up a ton of vertical shoots. So I think I'll leave it. And it's just a wild tree anyway. It's got some decent fruit on it, but it's nothing to write home about. Um, but I like just the aesthetics of the tree, and it lets me practice my shaping and pruning. So it's always nice if you do have like a wild apple tree, something like this, you know, use it as your guinea pig to learn off of. I've got a bunch of failed grafts on here, for example. Let's see if we can find them. They're hilarious. So you've got, you know, some failed grafts on here. Um, these are some of the first grafts I ever did, like four or five years ago. There was another one somewhere else around here, and uh, you know, so I tried and failed on this tree before I started to, you know, graft other trees. I'm still getting good at that. So I've got a lot to learn. That is definitely a, a practice that's an art. And we've got the cold hearted kiwi growing up. You know, so I've left some little longer pruning nubs to kind of hold it in and then it wraps up around. And this year it's gonna climb right up into the top of this apple tree. At the beginning of last season, it was, you know, still down here somewhere. So this is pretty much all one season's growth. I expect this year this tree is going to be covered in cold hardy kiwi um, especially here on the south side I've been trying to kind of promote it to come out to the south side to the Sun and I'd like to have it where it's all this whole entire canopy here is dangling cold hardy kiwi that way I turn a bit of a wild apple um, into a very useful trellis for kiwi so another thing we do is we've been stool mounding some stuff so stool mounding is where you have a bush or a vine that comes out at one spot and there's multiple branches coming out and you hill it up with wood and then it roots into it. So I don't want to 
pull the soil away until we do it, but this is an area here where we mounded up the soil all around this cold hardy kiwi. And the hopes is that I can turn one plant into, you know, maybe 10 and go plant them elsewhere. And I'll show you a hascap down here where I was also doing that. Just make sure I don't step on anything. It's hard when everything's so brown to know if you're stepping on a tree or not. So you can see this has cap, you can really see how we've stool mounded it. We've mounded all the soil up and around it, and you can even see it's growing roots right into it, and then it's they're popping out of the soil, hitting the air, and they're getting basically tip layered. So um, that's kind of really interesting as well. They're getting air layered. Um, some nice charcoal. Uh, because when the roots get air layered and you know they die at the tip they really uh, turn into this really dense network of roots and you can see that's happened here so I bet you if I just wanted to say pull this whole plant out dig the whole thing out and then separate it out and divide it I probably got about 25 plants there that are very very well rooted so maybe we'll do that this year and we'll get you know, for our one time, maybe $8 investment in has caps, we'll get, I don't know, 20 plants. Or maybe we'll do that this year. So stay tuned, stick around and watch that video on how we do stool mounding to multiply plants and photocopy money. That's what it's all about. So here's the grapes. I want to show two things. First off, how I clean the grapes up. I think that's useful um, even though it's not the right way to do it I'll explain a little more about that in a sec but then also I want to just describe the general trellis structure I talked about this in a video early last season um, but see how I have the cross members to um, these these basically are really good for resisting the whole entire thing you know this post and that post both going this way and then the top bar going this way so it resists that kind of motion a whole heaval to this side um, I mentioned that I should have put some on this way as well, which I didn't and You know, maybe I should listen to myself now and then because That's what happened this year in the winter time So I'm just waiting for the snow to kind of defrost and then I'll be able to kind of push this back square it up and then add some um, You know members to support that there to resist that motion. So that's why you want those 45s is it'll resist that kind of, you know, turning your square into a um, eraser parallelogram. So let's talk about how I prune the grapes and why that's not the right way to prune, but why that's okay. Some astute watchers might have noticed a missing spe uh, a missing old friend, the, uh, the old apricot that basically never made it. So he's been chopped up and added as compost and I don't think I'll put another tree there I might add some bushes but I said before this is my septic and this is the leach field so putting a tree there is probably not the best idea grapes are shallow rooted they're okay um, but like you know a big apricot tree probably wasn't the best idea anyways so we'll probably add some shallow rooted bushes there all right let's talk about the grapes already Okay, so what you want to do ideally with a grapevine is not what I've done here. You typically want in the first couple years to allow, uh, you know, to train this straight up vertical to become kind of like a waist high tree. And then after that point, it'll send out a couple cordons to each side. And you basically, you know, for example, I've picked two here. You might pick two main ones going sideways and then some off ones coming off. And you'll prune back to that core shape pretty much every year. Now there's different pruning varieties. Some require spur pruning and all that. I don't want to get too much. I don't want to make this a great pruning video. But just in general, you want to create kind of like a short waist high tree with a couple strong branches going off and kind of train them out wherever you want to go. For me, for this project here, because I wanted this to be a giant arbor that I walk under, I need to get them up. So um, I actually am not pruning back all the way down to waist level every year. I'm planning on pruning back kind of to a roughly where it is now. So this year is the first year they've kind of reached up into the canopy and they're up at the top now of this. And this will thicken up at the end of this year and I will probably prune back roughly to here 
on each of these now from now on for the basically the rest of these grapes life and I'll try to get them to trellis across the top so I can reach and grab and pull the grapes off. So that's kind of what I'm going for here. Um, typically you wouldn't want to have that much, like that long of a regular vine uh, growing out of your grapes. It kind of just, you know, it's a lot of energy to push all that uh, nutrient and water up that grapevine. So you just kind of want to avoid that um, if you can. And I missed a prune here. I don't know why this is like that. Did something eat that or did I just not prune it properly? So that should be pruned back as far as you kind of you can without going into the core vine. But that's kind of what I'm going to do with the grapes. Um, I pruned off any kind of side shoot all the way up because I just want this to basically become a tree trunk. And then eventually, hopefully, I can remove these scaffolds and it'll just be, you know, it'll be firm like this. It'll be firm and hard and solid, you know, like that all the way up. So that's what I'm kind of going for here. It's not what you would normally do um, when you're pruning your grapes, but it's what I'm doing in this specific instance. And here we've got um, a vine. To be honest, I don't know what it is. It's a uh, probably some kind of clematis or it's not wisteria, but some kind of ornamental um, vine that I don't know what it is because I'm not really good with ornamental stuff. I just know permaculture, edible plants, medicinal plants. Um, and it's gotten a bit crazy and all that, but um, what I'm thinking of doing this year is, you know, I've been pr prioritizing getting the grapes over to this trellis. And then now that they're there, I think what I'll do is I'll go ground level and I'll cut this thing and kill it. And it's gonna sucker like crazy, but I'll just cut those out as it goes. And I'll kill that and then I'll leave most of this wood as like a functioning trellis. This, uh, you know, this arbor is kind of iffy. So the actual vine wood is holding it together. So I don't want to rip all that off. It'll just fall apart. It's actually strengthening it right now, but I'll clean it up. And then hopefully this will, the grape will take over this as well and climb over here, climb into some of the ornamental hydrangeas and, or it's not hydrangeas, I don't even know. Just climb up, climb up into all the ornamental stuff that I don't really care about. And then uh, I'll have grapes growing in my ornamentals as well as some ability to cut flowers and stuff like that. And that's kind of nice as well. So lots of grape pruning yesterday as well. So I still have to come and prune some of these raspberries. Um, stuff was pruning them for me here. So something came in and ate a lot of this. I don't know if that was deer in my backyard that I didn't notice. It's actually not bad because I want to prune them. Like, look at all this rabbit poop. You guys see this? Look at it all in here. And I've been, I've been pulling it out actually and adding it to some of my other fruit trees. Crazy. So. Normally what I like to do, these are um, ever-bearing, so they'll grow and fruit on first year wood in the fall, and then they'll stay around for one more season, and uh, they'll fruit again, sorry, I see my shadow there, um, and they'll fruit again in the spring, so they'll send out some sideways lateral shoots, and they'll, they'll fruit again in the spring. So with these, what I like to do is typically cut them like belt level, so a little higher, cut them a little higher, like belt level compared to these are kind of like knee level. And because of that, it removes the auxin from the tip, which is a chemical or a hormone that causes more vertical growth. So when that auxin's removed, it creates a bunch of lateral growth. And the raspberry will fruit off of that lateral um, wood on the cane. So it's this way that you can kind of maximize the harvest of your raspberries. For this particular variety, if you have the summer bearing, um, or the fall bearing, I believe, which are the ones that will basically grow and fruit, but then they won't fruit again, then you would basically mow this to the ground at the beginning of the season and just reset it completely. And then it would regrow and fruit on the same, uh, the same year's wood. This one's a little different. So I'll come in and I'll cut these belt level and I'll show you um, somewhere else where I did exactly that. Look at this birch. This birch has lost its... Uh, it's kind of baby bark, and it's now getting that beautiful paper birch bark. Oh, there's 
that just screams Canada to me. I don't know, it's just where I grew up, I guess, but birch just feels so Canadian. So I wanted to make sure I got some birch in my food forest. All right, so here is my wild, uh, my sorry, my raspberry patch. And I've gone through and completely cleaned this out with uh, all the old wood is gone. You can tell the old wood because it's like quite a bit darker. See, there's some kind of on the ground there. It's kind of gray, dead looking. It's dead. So it's dead, it's dead looking. And then we went in, this is about belt height right here. And we pruned them all to roughly belt height. So this will be a really nice producing patch of raspberries this season. This is actually the season or the spot where some of the videos I take, you can't see through it. It looks like literally just a wall of green and you can barely see through it, especially if I stand down in this swale. Uh, down here, you can see I've cut a little swale into here. We've got hazelnuts down there, more raspberries that I have to prune. Um, this, you can't even see into it in the spring, summertime. So it's kind of neat how wide open everything is in the fall. And then, uh, you know, it looks, everything's dead and it doesn't look like there's much going on here. But then spring hits and it just gets crazy in here. So super fun season coming up. We've got to still get rid of some more of these Drew's Martichoke stalks. This is great compost food. It's great chop and drop carbon. Um, it's great biochar stock. So this stuff's really, really easy to work with. It's, you know, very, very easy to break and chew up. And this all turns into wonderful um, biochar if you want, or you can just break it up, chop it down, throw it down on the ground like this was a couple years ago maybe, maybe last year, and it'll just break, break down, decompose, and turn back into some amazing soil. Can't dig down very deep. Um, everything's still frozen. But this is a great bed, amazing soil in here for sure. You can see nice water holding, sucking and storing and holding it. We've got some pooling going on as that leaches down and holds into the swale. So fantastic. Design your garden beds on contour anywhere you can. It really helps minimize watering. All right, we've got some, some deer damage that we found over the last couple days just walking around investigating. So... You know, something came in and ripped this right off. A fairly short little stump on this cherry now. And uh, here as well, we've got some gnawing here and then along the bark. So we do get some rabbit damage, rodent damage. Uh, the tree should survive that, no problem, as long as it's not right through. As long as it's not right around the trunk. So we've got some very mild deer brows damage here nothing i'm too worried about for this one um some other ones got hit hard let's go show you one of those okay so this is back to that raspberry patch that i just had mentioned uh pruning so that's it over there um so this is looking back the other way this is one of my deer entry points i mentioned that i do bramble hill to kind of keep the deer away um, and it works for the most part but you know i guess nothing's really perfect because this little guy here who i grew the raspberries up to hide him from the deer is absolutely decimated this year so i don't think this is survivable it looks pretty bad i mean it might be it might be survivable the trunk's okay the trunk's fine and parts of this might be able to send out a some kind of stick maybe i could prune this off and then just go for something growing out of the side here prune this off this doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere so i might be able to uh, to salvage this who knows but you know rabbits rabbits everywhere and deer everywhere so there's Ginny down there your job's to find the rabbits Ginny. got this on the ground which means something was digging up the Jerusalem artichokes and enjoying them so that's pretty good because I would rather them digging up the artichokes than digging up my trees or 
you know, bulbs of my tulips or daffodils or whatever. So maybe another reason to plant Jerusalem artichokes is stuff likes to eat those and it's kind of better that it eats those than some of your other stuff, maybe. Got a ton of garlic poking up. Hey, Lucy. So tons of garlic, this whole entire area. I wanna be careful where I walk, but this whole area is planted out to garlic. So we've got, she's licking my hand. We got garlic all through here. Tons and tons of garlic this year coming up in this little spot. So that's nice to see. Means winter's done. Good riddance. Man, the smell is just crazy. That garlic smell already. You know, this just started popping up. And already, you know, it's just a super strong garlic smell in there. So, I totally believe the whole garlic um, can hide your fruit trees from animals. Because leaning down this low, I can just smell the garlic. Holy. Okay, at some point I'm going to do a daikon radish video. Um, I, for just for soil building, not even for growing a crop with them. Um, this is a daikon radish that I'm planting just in this bed as a, you know, it was an experimental leave it in the ground and turn a daikon radish into worm food. And this is a really, really useful tool if you have compacted soils, clay soils, that sort of thing. It's a natural way to break your soils apart. So um, this is what it looks like the next year. And you can see, you know, it's just totally decomposing. It's kind of like a, you know, like a fibrous material is all that's left. It's still kind of frozen. Um, and just over the next summer now, this is basically, it grew last year, and it'll decompose this coming year. And over this next year, it'll basically just be a giant tube of worm castings. So we'll kind of follow up with it, uh, see how that goes. But this is just daikon radishes for soil building. And we've got a couple of them in here, some of the smaller ones. This is a bed that I just completely neglected, like literally didn't even visit um, all the rest of the season. So we just sowed it out to some perennials. We put some... Um, we put some seedlings in here, maybe generate some kind of trees, and uh, that's pretty much it. We're probably going to plant some perennial stuff in here this year. I was thinking maybe pecans, but they kind of need a little bit more sun. Uh, Shagbark hickory, we'll probably make some kind of juglins guild down here. Maybe we'll do continuation pawpaw with, on the north side, some of the nut trees. But all these beds are going to get turned over into perennial this year. And, you know, these sumac trellises, they lasted about five years. Wind storm took everything down. And uh, instead of rebuilding any of this stuff and coming all the way down here for my kitchen garden, like my tomatoes, we're just going to transition into, into perennials down here. Stuff that I can harvest at the end of the season. I don't have to be, be down here, you know, every single year or uh, every single day, I mean. So, old man walking trail, quick little update. You can see for the most part, the leaves stayed where they were put. Um, kind of neat, considering we had windstorms that took trees down, you know. <laughs> you know, we had windstorms that took trees down, ripped two panels off of my uh, gazebo, um, ripped shingles off the roof, and these leaves totally still in place. So, that's the power of windbreaks. Um, you've got wind breaks all around this whole entire lower area here. So, anywhere you can, if you can put wind breaks in, it's microclimates for keeping the cold northern Arctic winds from coming down into your property, but even just the drying summer winds um, to wick moisture away. A little sheltered valley like this will hold a lot more moisture and will need less watering. So this is probably going to be an incredible fertile spot um, in the future. I'm really glad I started this project. It took me a couple weekends and I don't remember how many bags of leaves. Somewhere around 1,500 bags of leaves. Um, but it was fun and it'll be amazing. I'll probably plant into this next season. I'll let these leaves decompose for a full season. See what pops up. 
I'll manage some of the trees like the willows and the pawpaws and the apples. Uh, but for the most part, we won't plant this out until next season, I think. I'm always finding stuff that I planted and I don't remember planting. Um, this here is a Rugosa rose. Uh, rose of Rugosa. We've got sage here. And this is a pawpaw. And I didn't even know I had a pawpaw here. And you can tell I didn't know because I basically just put leaves all around it. So... That's kind of interesting. I must have thought that I wanted some more pawpaw diversity and I snuck a pawpaw down in here at some point. But, or it's a sucker from this one. Wouldn't that be cool if this is already starting to sucker? I don't think it is because they will make their little suckers. Um, I don't think it is. I think I did plant that. So that's kind of interesting. It's always neat, like, you know, the squirrel planting methodology. You know, it's always kind of fun to see what what you did, you know, on a, a weekend, a couple beers in, maybe, and uh, just planting trees. Here's a bush service berry, so this is a canadensis. Um, I'm a Lancher canadensis, and uh, this is more the bird variety. Um, it's got smaller fruit, it's not the Saskatoon variety, the alnifolia. Um, this one I kind of wanted to encourage it to branch out a little bit so we did actually do some pruning and they're all heading cuts so this will be interesting to watch how this tree reacts I don't think that this is a tree that likes to be pruned very much you kind of just let it go so we'll see how this does um, but I really wanted to get you know instead of it growing up I want to get it to grow out so I want this to be the next vertical leader along this branch same thing here I want it growing out and back and then we even left this weird sucker coming out just because it's neat. So normally you would want to cut something like that out of a, you know, a normal fruit, fruit bearing tree, but sometimes funkiness and weirdness can be really beautiful. So in these um, more, uh, you know, support level plants, like a bird support plant, I kind of like to promote sometimes a gangly, weird little guy coming off to the side. I think it always adds a little bit of character. Here's the elderberry that was, it's right in the rock. And the rock has a tunnel that goes through and connects it to the lake. So it's actually in standing water that froze. And uh, I was just kind of feeling it and it feels like it's alive still. So it feels pliable. Um, you can always scratch it. Let's try and see if we can do that. Scratch it and see the green, and I do. Let me see if I can. You see that? So you can scratch the wood, see if you got a green cambium layer underneath. That means it's still alive. So right up to the tip of the branch, it's still alive. That means it survived basically being in sunken water and frozen in a block of ice. So that's kind of cool. Um, additionally, here's the fig. Its mound of snow is gone. And let's do the scratch test here. Uh, this one feels, you know what, that's hard. It's hard, but I think it's green. That would be awesome. That would be so super cool. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Um, showing you the back of the house because this year's big major project is solar. So we're putting in a 10 kilowatt array on top of our house to help power up our Tesla. And uh, now we can drive for free, power the pond pumps guilt free. It's a pretty green grid, but it's always nice. You know, we have a, uh, a decent electrical load at this property with the Tesla especially. Um, three kids. I spend half my life, literally half my life is spent turning off lights in my house and computer screens and TVs. So um, that will help pay for some of that without destroying the environment. And we're going to put a nice metal roof on as well. Um, so I want to get a good roof on the solar because the solar is going to be there for 50 years or so. So I want to get a nice roof underneath the solar. And there's some storm damage on the roof. So it's going to be an expensive project but one that pays itself off so it's more of an investment than a project and you'll see solar panels on that roof later on if you're looking this fall hopefully if everything goes well 
So thanks for watching guys and I'll see you on the next one.